Well, uh, thank you for the nice introduction, and um, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, present the material I'm going to um, show today. Uh, no financial disclosures. All of us are uh, familiar with the idea that the trabecular meshwork controls 75% of resistance to outflow, but my talk today is going to really challenge that and suggest that the outflow is really controlled by a far more complex system and involves both the distal and the proximal uh, tissues. And uh, it actually is a conceptually a, a pump. And uh, you might ask why I could challenge uh, Dr. Grant's uh, concepts, which uh, he was the one who really developed that. And as Dale said, I uh, spent a year in a lab working on this. And um, basically, uh, I learned a lot. It's a much more complex issue than I had initially thought. So I did his work uh, back in a long time ago in 1958-63. But when I arrived in the lab about 1972, uh, he really had come up with a very different conceptual framework that never got into the textbooks, but it's, uh, I think a really crucial thing to understand. Um, Ellington and uh, Grant wrote two papers, each of which said that the resistance isn't in the trabecular meshwork itself, it's in the mechanical properties of the meshwork that pull it away from the external wall of Schlem's canal. And uh, both uh, Ellington, Grant, uh, Mike Van Buskirk and I, we wrote eight or nine papers to this effect, but uh, it never really kind of uh, penetrated the literature, which uh, really had the wonderful sound bite of the resistance in the uh, uh, meshwork itself. So uh, just to look at a little bit of what um, Ellington and Grant did, uh, this is uh, the technique he, uh, Grant used for his original work, just uh, uh, entering the anterior chamber with a perfusion system, but he always did an iridectomy. Uh, and that equilibrated the uh, pressures between the chambers, and these are nucleated eyes, uh, so it's going to create a uh, situation that doesn't have any ciliary muscle tension. Uh, and uh, then they went ahead uh, and looked at what happens uh, when you in increase pressures over a range and what the facility of outflow is. And it turns out it drops rapidly as intraocular pressure increases. Uh, it's a, a family of curves, actually. It's not a single situation. And uh, Dr. Grant did his original work uh, at what's equivalent to 33 millimeters of mercury. He did it at 25. You have to add 8 because of the transtrabecular pressure gradients. So that's where he found 75% of resistance. But when uh, uh, Ellington and Grant looked at this in more detail at physiologic pressures, they only found 14% uh, uh, of resistance in the meshwork. Uh, at pressures of 13 and then 27 percent at 18. So this concept of facility of outflow in the meshwork uh, was complex and they realized, well, this is probably caused by the meshwork coming into relationship to the external wall of Schlem's canal. So they did an incredibly uh, interesting experiment was, was to then in, uh, perfuse the eyes uh, with uh, out doing an iridectomy, which drove the lens iris diaphragm backward uh, and placed a tension on the scleral spur so, uh, through the ciliary muscle. So they simulated normal ciliary muscle tension. And what they found was that the uh, trabecular meshwork, or the, I should say the facility of outflow, didn't change at all as they increased pressure. So they envisioned this as the trabecular meshwork actually uh, moving outward in response to pressure gradient changes and that if it was held back properly uh, by the ciliary muscle tension, uh, there wouldn't be any change with increasing pressure, a very different conceptual framework than you're probably familiar with. And again, uh, this is where they did their work. So I, I came to the lab with this whole conceptual framework already in place and, and a very different uh, idea than is out in the literature. Uh, so what I did, I looked at a series of primate eyes uh, and also human eyes uh, at everywhere from zero to 50 millimeters of mercury and, and basically fixed them at the different pressures. And everybody who thought the meshwork was a stable uh, structure didn't move. Uh, uh, Goldman actually commented in his papers that it's a stiff structure, all made out of collagen. But in fact, it's a very, very different uh, structural arrangement. And as you can see here, it extends out to the external wall of Slim's Canal. And uh, even, this is 25 millimeters of mercury. Every time we blink, we probably drive our pressures to that level. And we're in apposition with the external wall of Slim's Canal. We found even at 17 to 18 millimeters, there was canal apposition. 
So uh, on your right upper panel there is uh, basically a, a living primate eye that was fixed in vivo at uh, physiologic pressure. But at the same time, I did a, a techniques that involved with the eye, with the animal still alive, fixing uh, after the pressure dropped so that the um, blood could reflux into Slim's canal. And uh, the panels show basically uh, eyes with, um, this is a fellow eyes of the same uh, primate, and you can see profoundly different configuration in the tissues. Uh, it's highly uh, mobile. Uh, well, the other thing that I started seeing was these structures and uh, hundreds of serial sections through these things in different configurations. Kept seeing these uh, structures spanning Slim's canal, which are not at all apparent at physiologic pressures. And uh, they look like little valves, and this is at intraocular pressure above epistural venous pressure, but we can also look at it uh, with the epistural venous pressure higher. And the valve-like arrangement collapses, and uh, this is the uh, same thing as uh, Schlund's canal interval endothelium, so it's highly contractile, and uh, it's, it appears to have a conduit. This is the funnel, the uh, arrangement with the cylindrical portion, distal portion, and uh, for a number of years, I failed in figuring out some way to dilate the canal to look at it without blood, but finally when viscoelastics came along, uh, it turned out it really worked beautifully to look at the canal because the viscoelastic washes out. And we can see these diaphanous structures within the canal. And Bart Smith and I did a lot of work in this arena and uh, showed that there are about uh, 70 of these around the circumference of Schlund's Canal. They're very common and probably a, a crucial factor in the outflow system. Uh, the last uh, 10 years or so back in the lab, I've uh, managed to look at this with uh, many different uh, techniques and uh, explore it. So here's uh, with viscoelastic and then canal, and we can see uh, with SEM, the uh, just cannulicator space, a conduit, the lumen, and we can look at uh, with uh, 500 nanometer microspheres with uh, confocal microscopy, seeing the uh, uh, channels crossing the canal, the conduit, and uh, we can look at this with uh, confocal native fluorescence, uh, with this being the cylindrical portion, the, uh, uh, I should say the funnel portion, this is a cylinder, and then here's an opening, and uh, we can see the collector channel entrance, and then we can see uh, the hinge flaps are uh, around essentially all the collector channel entrances, and uh, we can see the also the connection with the trabecular meshwork. So when the meshwork moves, these uh, structures along the external wall will move as well. Well, how does this play into the ocular pulse uh, situation? And we know that the ocular pulse is about three millimeters, eye motion is about uh, 10, and blinking is 10 as well. So uh, we blink about three times a minute, so we're driving our pressures up into the mid-20s uh, typically every time we uh, blink, and this whole phenomenon is occurring regularly. And we seem to have a little glitch here, but we'll see what plays out. There we go. Uh, so this is uh, an aqueous vein, you see that little uh, black dot there. Aqueous is coming out and uh, basically it's an oscillatory equilibrium with uh, the blood from the epscleral vessels and you're seeing uh, aqueous come out and then uh, pass distally along the canal. Well, interesting aspect of this is that Asher and Goldman uh, initially discovered it, but there are many, many papers that came out documenting this behavior and this behavior fails in glaucoma. Uh, the pressure, the, I should say, the pulse begins to slow and then stops, and it's restored in uh, drops that um, reduce interocular pressure. So there's some phenomenon related to this pulsatile flow that's uh, crucial to function. The pulsatility just isn't just in the aqueous veins. This is a gonioscopic view of the iris, trabecular meshwork, and you'll see blood-tinged aqueous passing uh, within the collector channels here from inside the eye, and we've managed to um, show this with um, gonioscopy, and this is uh, Robert Stegman's work. He's just done beautiful work in this area. You're actually watching uh, aqueous, um, uh, blood-tinged aqueous moving up and down within a collector channel in an oscillatory fashion where he's equilibrated the uh, pressure gradients. Then we can look at the Slim Canal Inlet Valve arrangement with the um, base of the funnel. You'll see the uh, cylindrical portion and then the distal portion. And 
we can look at this in the gonioscopic view with blood intentionally refluxed into the canal at the base of the funnel, or the cylindrical portion, and then aqueous and blood mixing in Schlem's canal at the tube distal end. It can only be aqueous because that's the only thing available. Uh, we have aqueous wave propagating uh, from the anterior chamber, uh, and here you can watch this. It's uh, slowed down to 50 percent, but you can actually watch the pulse waves, the uh, progression of the aqueous pulse wave into Schlem's canal. So we got a conduit system, uh, which we've shown anatomically uh, by now many different techniques, and uh, we can look at it in real time in vivo in patients, and thanks to Robert Stegman. So based on this uh, conceptual framework, I put together uh, a paper which suggested that the apparatus is a pulsatile system, a pump, with a basically ability of the trabecular meshwork to move and a set of valves which is uh, driving the pump. Uh, and uh, the conceptual framework, I think, in general still holds, but uh, uh, there's a piece missing, actually, there, there's quite a bit missing that uh, needed to be sorted out. Uh, some of the requirements of a diaphragm pump, which is uh, true of all the cardiovascular system, is uh, it requires a compressible chamber, which Slim Canal qualifies, compressible tissue, trabecular meshwork, driving force, the ocular pulse, and then the Slim Canal inlet valves, which I've just uh, described. But we didn't have any evidence of an outlet valve, and uh, I was uh, criticized r rather roundly at some of the basic science meetings because I couldn't come up with that. Well, in fact, uh, this is a work I published with Dr. Grant. Uh, this is actually published work uh, showing um, the trabecular mesh work, uh, Slim Canal. And the, this hinged uh, conjunctival flap, or uh, I should say hinged collagen flap at a collector channel entrance. And uh, it was very striking. And this is in a nucleated human eye, but even more striking is what it happens um, in the uh, living primate eye. So this is a living primate uh, at the time of fixation, that is. And uh, we look here, we can see the, a comparable uh, collagen flap. We can see the arrows pointing to appositional closure between the flap and the external wall of Schlem's canal. But even more fascinating is that it seemed to be holding back blood. It was acting as a valve preventing reflux. And um, there was an attachment between this uh, tip of this and the uh, trabecular meshwork. And then we looked at the same situation uh, with the reversal of pressure gradients with uh, blood refluxing into the canal. And we can see the uh, canal filled with blood. Um, and we see this same type of hinged flap and the connection actually goes down to the uh, trabecular meshwork. So it showed that the trabecular meshwork is basically pulled backward, opening up the uh, hinged flaps and effectively acting a valve-like arrangement. But at the time uh, when, we, when I really saw this, it, it just was way too much to try and uh, convince anybody about. And uh, it's been many years that uh, I worked on it. We finally got enough material together uh, with the documentation that this was published in 2017. <laughs> um, so I, just working out in the lab what might be going on, I set up a series of uh, techniques that allow us to look in real time, uh, sort of um, ground truth. And uh, this is a two millimeter uh, limbal segment, radial wedge with the trabecular meshwork, cornea, et cetera and uh, ciliary body, and we can look at the uh, uh, Schlem's canal, electric channel entrance, a septum, and uh, by just infusing uh, fluid, uh, we can, uh, from a cannula, from a, basically from the anterior chamber um, position, uh, we can watch this whole apparatus in motion, and there, we can look at connections. So we can actually watch the meshwork here, moving up and down, in and out. We can watch the uh, tissues uh, between the collector channels and the external wall in motion uh, and watch the external wall move as well. So we've got this connected arrangement which we can look at just in real time. Uh, then uh, another way to look at this is to simply uh, place a balanced salt solution stream down on the uh, canal and we can watch what happens to all of these tissues in real time. They're exquisitely sensitive to pressure changes. So just the slightest uh, pressure on this uh, little, or I should say pressure from uh, fluid from a cannula, the whole apparatus uh, uh, goes into motion. 
with uh, evidence of all these uh, relationships between the trabecular meshwork and the uh, flaps and also the uh, intrascleral uh, collector channel arrangement. So this uh, shows us what we can see. And uh, it's an incredible little system. <clears throat> so how do you look at this in the laboratory and provide uh, convincing uh, evidence? And uh, for this, uh, I turned to Ricky Wang, who uh, I'm so fortunate that he has an imaging lab uh, next to me. And he's, he's uh, just an absolutely premier person in OCT imaging with uh, many innovations. So we set up a system with a, a limbal segment, um, a quadrant, and uh, faced it upward. So the trabecular meshwork's looking at us. And then we um, uh, had an OCT system. We had a very short working distance on it. And uh, some algorithms that really improved the uh, ability to look at the situation. And uh, we then looked at, uh, we placed a cannula inside of Schlem's canal, sealed it, and then we attached to a um, switch, which switched between two reservoirs, one at 30 and one at zero millimeters of mercury. So now we take control of the system and we can introduce pressure into the canal. We can stepwise increase or decrease pressures for steady state um, measurements. And we can also look at uh, uh, differences by uh, switching between the reservoirs, we can actually watch this in real time, undergo changes in configuration. So we're seeing here uh, uh, trabecular meshwork, uh, cannula and Schlem's canal, uh, the same cannula in an orthogonal view with the end of the cannula, uh, the Schlem's canal appearance, and this is a 10 millimeters mercury pressure gradient across the system, which entirely fills Schlem's canal and uh, dilates it. Now we're able to see these uh, collector channel entrances, which uh, really is uh, a wonderful arrangement because we have these three-dimensional three volumes with OCT, which can rotate into any plane. So each one of them, we can go ahead and uh, optimize the relationship to the collector channel entrances. And when we do this, uh, we can see the trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal, uh, collector channel entrance, but we see all these hinged flaps at the collector channel entrance, and they're uh, very consistent uh, presence uh, at the entrances. But what's really actually much more interesting is that these are all attached to the trabecular meshwork by these little conduits I showed you earlier, and we can see them throughout the whole system here. Uh, and if you'll notice, they're uh, always uh, oriented at an oblique angle. So if the meshwork moves outward, uh, which we'll do at low pressure, uh, it will pull the, 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 uh, the flaps open and open the, the collector channels. And then if the pressure rises, it'll close them. So basically, it has an intrinsic mechanism for homeostasis. So you can see all these uh, uh, connections here. Uh, SEM uh, with the trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal, uh, uh, channels, and then this hinge flap, which uh, both the two hinges here, which really uh, are in a position to control um, flow through the system, and we see the connections to the uh, between the trabecular meshwork and the hinge flaps. Uh, we'll look. At, this is actually an exterior section from the same uh, uh, SEM. Uh, situation and uh, we can compare the SEM with OCT. We're actually with this very high resolution system, we're approaching uh, uh, what we can see with uh, SEM. So, ciliary muscle, trabecular meshwork, uh, Schlem's canal, the collector channel, and uh, septum. Uh, and then we see the connections uh, between trabecular meshwork and the uh, collector channel uh, hinge entrance. And we can watch this in motion. So we can actually uh, watch what's going on in, in uh, effectively real time here. Uh, we can also watch these hinge flaps uh, again, trabecular meshwork, the uh, canal, the collector channel, and the hinges. And we're watching this uh, in motion in uh, real time. I'm looping these, of course, so we see it. So. Um, 
My original conceptual framework is uh, somewhat limited because there's a more complex a situation here with uh, phenomena going on in the external wall. So if we think of this as a Schlumpf's canal uh, inner wall endothelium, and we have these uh, hinged uh, flaps here uh, with canal outlet valve arrangement, whole apparatus can swing uh, depending on what the pressure gradients are. It can swing outward or backward, so it provides an apparatus that can uh, provide a level of control over pressure and also over pulse that'll flow. Mm. Um, so again, we can see this in uh, real time, in a sense. Um, so conceptually, we, we have a lot of evidence that the trabecular meshwork comes out to the external wall of Slim's Canal and, and collapses in glaucoma. There are actually quite a number of papers uh, documenting that, including the uh, work with uh, Dr. Grant. And the idea here is that in glaucoma, uh, the lastness of the trabecular beams may be terribly important, the ability for them to pull backward, maintain the configuration so that they can undergo normal motion and that uh, in glaucoma, for whatever reason, this uh, is lost and the ciliary muscle tension may be a crucial feature. Well, we have also uh, the question still of, well, what goes on in vivo? And so we've uh, pursued that over the last couple of years. And uh, we, with SDOCT, uh, the maximum resolution is about four microns. Uh, it's the limits of optics. You can't get any better. But phase OCT doesn't detect uh, structure, it detects motion, and it is incredibly sensitive. It actually is capable of 10 to the minus 12 uh, picometer level uh, resolution, but in a situation like this, it's sensitive to 20 nanometers, so it's basically three orders of magnitude better than uh, standard procedures. And uh, again, very fortunate to work with Ricky Wang, who was the original developer of uh, the phase-based uh, techniques that are totally different than, uh, than the standard uh, procedures. So we basically set up an ocular pulse uh, in, in the nucleated eyes with the phase OCT, and um, we're able to then control uh, pressure uh, and the pulse waves. And this is a heat map of uh, outward motion of trabecular meshwork, recoil, and this is time, uh, the ocular pulse, which we uh, uh, introduce as an experimental variable. And uh, we then look at the trabecular meshwork motion, and we find motion here of um, about four microns, uh, both uh, distending and recoiling. It distends and recoils spontaneously. And that's enough. We did the calculations to uh, basically uh, drive all of aqueous outflow. <coughs> and note here the synchrony of the ocular pulse and the trabecular meshwork motion, which is uh, made more manifest in these uh, uh, images with the heat map. And the next thing we did was, again, still in nucleated eyes, was to look at what happens uh, when you increase uh, pressure and then uh, you look at uh, what happens to the trabecular meshwork motion. And so we kept the ocular pulse the same at three millimeters every time. So it sort of simulates what's going on in vivo in the anterior chamber. Um, but then uh, we increased the pressure. And what was so striking is that there's an exponential decay in the motion of the trabecular meshwork as interocular pressure increases. So basically, it loses the ability of motion uh, to move. And uh, we looked at this, of course, uh, with the, um, um, the SDOCT images as well, the same tissue. And uh, you can see that the canal collapses. So we have an explanation for the lack of uh, trabecular meshwork motion. Uh, well, the next step, of course, is, well, can we do this in vivo? It's a much more challenging problem because of uh, bulk motion, uh, saccades, all sorts of phenomena that limit it. But uh, Ricky, uh, with his uh, OCT techniques, was able to achieve this. We use a digital pulsimeter to uh, um, synchronize, and we have a trigger that synchronizes with the uh, OCT system. And so we can then uh, monitor this in real time. And uh, what you see here is uh, um, the uh, basically systole and diastole and a displacement map showing the trabecular meshwork motion in humans in vivo. And uh, we can watch this uh, occurring. 
this is a uh, trabecular meshwork collector channel entrance, and then we have um, the ability to look at uh, systole, where in systole the outward motion is uh, reflected in the red, and in diastole the uh, blue indicates the recoil toward the anterior chamber. And we can actually watch this um, in real time, and this is a living patient, so we've achieved that uh, capability at this point, which was uh, a challenge moving from uh, the laboratory many years ago, uh, seeing motion, which was not really very well, how could I say it, uh, uh, it took about an hour to fix the eye, so we really didn't know whether we could actually measure motion in real time and whether this was all real, but uh, now we can measure it. So basically, um, we have uh, intraocular pressure, which is vari uh, variable. Uh, daily, hourly, by the minute, we have compliance issues. We really don't have much um, idea of what's going on with our patients with intraocular pressure. Uh, and uh, the, on the other hand, the tissue properties are probably quite stable, sort of like um, the um, diabetics in the A1C uh, situation where you've got a, uh, something that's a, a stable situation that's long-term driving the homeostasis. And we uh, published a paper just this year showing high reproducibility of the uh, technique for uh, measuring the motion. And at uh, uh, Arvo this year, we uh, presented a paper uh, showing, comparing nine glaucoma and nine normal eyes, and we're able to cleanly separate the uh, groups of eyes. And uh, actually, using an ROC uh, curve, we could show differences uh, that were detectable with the uh, motion, but neither uh, uh, the IO, IOP or um, facility of outflow measurements were able to do a comparable prediction. So it could turn out to be quite a sensitive tool, and uh, we're hoping that it'll be valuable for diagnosis uh, because uh, we can detect, it looks like probably pretty early, a, a defect in the outflow system, and we want to catch all this stuff far upstream of damage uh, down, that goes on down the line. Uh, it may give us some ideas about prognosis and uh, monitoring as the uh, deterioration in the motion occurs, uh, maybe when to initiate therapy and uh, escalate. Uh, and then one of the real issues always is, well, what's going on in the outflow system? It looks like if there's no motion, there's probably not much going on in terms of flow either. Uh, because this whole system seems to be uh, driving the flow. So it, it's a means of uh, considering how to uh, properly place MIGs. And um, we can sort of summarize um, the, uh, some of the ideas here. The trabecular meshwork motion provides a means to sense the IOP. Effectively, this outward motion is like a little barometric uh, device. Uh, we have slim canal inlet and outlet valves. The trabecular meshwork is attached to the outlet system. So TM movement can drive uh, outflow valve movement, and the combination may provide a, a feedback mechanism to control pressure. Uh, now, all these are, of course, provisional ideas, but uh, it's good to have ideas uh, to, to test. Uh, the TM responds to the ocular pulse in real time. Uh, the entire system works in unison and uh, can explain pulse of aqueous outflow. And the idea is that uh, resistance results not uh, from slim canal wall apposition uh, in most of what we're finding, and the mechanical properties of the trabecular meshwork itself are what determine the motion, not, not flow through the meshwork itself, but the ability for the meshwork to recoil in response to pressure changes. Uh, we now have evidence the OCT can uh, measure motion, uh, it's a potential tool for glaucoma management, and uh, MIGS decisions may well benefit from this uh, knowledge. And uh, ciliary muscle tension seems to be a crucial factor uh, in resistance and flow, and there are actually a number of therapeutic targets that really uh, arise from this, and we're working on some, uh, some of them now, which uh, we've uh, published in some locations, and um, there may be some therapeutic, op therapeutic options uh, related to ciliary muscle tension. 
I'm um, really uh, deeply indebted to Martin Grant, Ricky Wang, and uh, Robert Stegman, who have been tremendously been helpful and it's been a real privilege to uh, work with uh, Ricky Wang as well as all the younger clinical investigators who have uh, worked with me so closely to take all this uh, forward. And uh, I thank you for listening. Murray, I think you just shared the most remarkable story of a course of a clinician scientist, persistent intellectual curiosity, applying the ongoing evolving technologies to solve a problem that's just a, a remarkable story. So thank you on behalf of the AGS. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're supposed to be a photographer here. <laughs>